just took a big gulp of water. Uh, gracias for having me. Uh, um, I'm joining you all from uh, my, my reservation, my home home, so Fort Mojave, um, or Makav Amatnj, or Hakulo, uh, which is where the water breaks. So um, again, where I am, things are, are named for uh, what has happened there or what is yet or still happening there. Um, it's really, really lucky to be here with you all. Um, uh, Omar, Nala, Ricky, uh, everyone who put this together. Um, I was, I was telling, um, I was telling the team earlier that, not too much earlier, since I was a little late. But I was telling, um, I was telling everyone earlier that uh, I was speaking with my my teacher, um, Hubert McCord, or uh, Matchumich Mahakev, earlier today, and we were talking about some Mojave words and concepts and. Um, and so it put a, a small curve into some of what I had been thinking about talking today. Um, and of course, still in the same stream of, of energy, yet just with, a, with an other shape now in it. So it feels lucky to share that. Um, I'm gonna begin with a small uh, PowerPoint. So it won't take up the whole time, but just to, it, one, it helps keep me on track if you were to see um, the mess I have here on my desk. Also, you might notice I'll be looking up because I write on the walls. And so a lot of words and things are just up on the wall that I'll grab as we move along. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and flip my, um, to screen share so you all can be with me um, in what I am thinking about. Try to make that, um, let's see, here we go. So I want to start with this uh, this quote. Um, I have been reading uh, Raul Surita. Um, I've just been spending a lot of time with with his work and thinking a lot about the Pacific Ocean, um, thinking a lot about land, um, about genocide, of course, um, as, as we do. And um, I had to learn how to speak again from total wreckage, almost from madness, so that I could still say something to someone. And I'm gonna read just a small, uh, a few like chips of, of um, quotes of his um, from, and this is, I wanted to try to find a book that everybody could access. So this is from um, uh, William Rowe's translation, but this is Norma Cole's preface. So um, yeah, so this is from the New York Review of Books. So I'm just gonna pop into a couple of his moments here. Um, and so this quote that I'm going to read is in reference to uh, the Biennale in Kerala, India in 2016, which he created um, a work for. And this work was dedicated to Galip Kurdi uh, who was um, Ailan Kurdi's brother. And um, of course, most of us who don't know, we know of Ailan Kurdi because we, were, we witnessed the photo of his body washed up on the shore um, near Bodrum, Turkey. And the one who we did not know um, was Galip uh, Kurdi, whose body was never found, but who was also um, in the transit part of that migration. And so uh, Zurita, of course, often speaks about the memory of water. But this was uh, one of the quotes um, that is in the film, um, the, pearl button, the Pearl Button or um, uh, Bouton de Nacre. It's hope for the world, which has no hope. Possibility for the world that has no possibility. It's love for the world that has no love. It's hope for the world which has no hope. Possibility for the world that has no possibility. It's love for the world that has no love. This quote by Surita feels like an essential, essential language for the condition of living, you know, across the world, but 
in, in the Americas in particular. Um, and I think it's a way that I have been thinking about writing in English and what that means that I write in English, that I speak in English, that I dream and imagine in English. And so again, back to the quote that's there that you can see, I had to learn how to speak again from total wreckage, almost from madness, so that I could still say something to someone. And I think that's, that's largely what I'm gonna talk with you all about today. I'm gonna to kind of leave these quotes up here so you can spend some time with just you know, the visual words. Um, and so that's gonna be one of the ways I relate some of what I'm thinking alongside you. And I consider this to be uh, we thinking alongside one another. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying out some wonders of mine. I'm trying to follow things, um, you know, with knowing you're there at the other end uh, to resist or catch or even to be a kind of through line for them. So um, I'm gonna be thinking a lot with you about English as being the frame for some of what uh, we wonder together. So let's see. So I had a, this is like kind of my uh, meta title, I guess, um, not because of any objection, which is part of a letter I'll show you next. Um, so I guess I've been thinking beneath this phrase for, for several years, not because of any objection. And where we'll head now, is towards some of the wonders that I've had with this phrase, not because of any objection as a lens um, about origin, migration, love, and freedom in English. So this is an excerpt from a letter written by the superintendent of the boarding school here at Fort Mojave. Um, it's just a up river and just up the road from, from where I'm at now. Um, and I still live on a land. I, I look, if I look north out my door right now, my front yard, I see our creation mountain. If I look south out my back door, I see the place where Mojaves go when they leave this life. So um, I, I'm very lucky to have this kind of, of relationship. Now the fort was put up on the, um, what we call the Mesa. So it's a little bit higher up. Um, and this letter was written to our chief, whose name was Pete Lambert, um, when he was a boy. He was about, um, I think they said he was between six and eight years old. So his birth certificate slides. So between six and eight years old, um, we already knew he was in line that he would be a chief or a leader. Uh, Yaltanak, we say, so um, someone who leads with their mouth. Um, and so this was written to him at, in a moment of, of recognizing his achievements as being a leader for his people by a white superintendent um, from the school at the time. I can remember when I first took you in the Fort Mojave school and what a time I had in cutting your hair for the first time. I can see now all the old Mojave women standing around crying while you covered your long hair with your arms and told me that I wouldn't dare to cut that hair off. But the hair was cut in spite of all your efforts and the direful predictions of the Mojave women. I compelled you to have your hair cut off, not because of any objections to the long hair in itself, but merely because the long hair was a symbol of savagery. And so we know that you know, we know that this was uh, part and parcel still is um, for the state, for the nation, when, um, when they are trying to diminish or occupy or control or break a people is to cut their hair. In particular, Mojaves, we, we traditionally cut our hair when we're mourning. Um, and so that was one of the ways that they, of course, civilized us here you know, flat, he says very plainly, the long hair was a symbol of savagery. And so something I'm really interested in 
uh, again, just with thinking about language is um, actually going to flip to... Okay, so I, I want to, I'm missing a slide here, that's why I'm pausing. Um, so I want to kind of just focus for a minute with you all on the very last um, part of this, this um, excerpt The I compelled you to have your hair cut off, not because of any objection to the long hair in itself, but merely because the long hair was a symbol of savagery. And so I've, I've been for, for a long time now, just pulling out these words, compelling, objected, and symbol, um, and thinking about them in relationship to, uh, to the ways we practice those um, or the ways they have been, um, have become uh, almost an anti-practice. And so one of the ways that I'll move with you through this is, um, is etymologically. So I'm gonna move etymologically through English and then also Makav or Mojave. Uh, we say Makav Chukwar, um, which, which is, is our language. Um, and one of the ways that I reconcile the way, uh, the pathway that I take with English, um, especially because etymologies are so important to me and it, it's one, it's part of how I learned my Mojave language by breaking it apart um, and, and being able to learn the different sensualities piece by piece, because I was raised in an, you know, an English country where sensuality uh, is blunted in many ways. And so uh, it makes sense to me that this is also the way I come to, to English. Um, and one of the ways that I reconcile some of that pathway is, um, is knowing that Latin, one of the centers of the Latin language began to cohere or constellate along a river. And so uh, I think I'm always sifting through uh, Latin and Greek for words that relate to water since water is such an important part of, of, our, of our Mojave language. You, um, you see it in, in numerous words. So when I think about English is that, and, and how, I, how I come to writing this. So, so part of, I was assuming I would get some writers here and also thinking uh, Omar about your students is, is you know what does it mean for those of us who have other languages in us you know whether they are um, active or not yet activated or you know whether they are happening in us in, in ways that we might not know as sensory speech for example or or intellect which are you know ways our brains have been shaped in in this language in the English language but one of the ways that I think about English is that it's a it it is itself it doesn't operate in it is itself a condition of dislocation is that by nature by necessity as intended it dislocates and so then it is unrelational um, and i'll talk a little bit more about um, relationality and what i mean by that um, and one of the things that i mean by english is unrelational is that it organizes, reiterates, and maintains body, water, and land as property. And that very specifically is intended to, to mute or dull, or again, dislocate sensuality. And one of the ways I think about relationality is that it is sensuality. Um, it is a way of, of being sensual with land, water, flesh, all the different bodies we have come to know. Um, my question, I guess, as I come to you is, how can I be sensual in English without needing to be sensual through English? And one of the ways that has, has been essential to me is to bring my Mojave language into English, to bring it into different spaces. At the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands, you know, we've started like Matakiev, that's the way we gather. We have Matakievs, you know, we don't have conferences or panels, but how do I bring these languages in? And how do we all bring these languages in without needing them to be translated into English, but allowing their practices to resound? Um, and so,
trying to trying to grapple with that is very difficult, even trying to find the articulation, because of course we're speaking in English, but English didn't make me in its image, because we as I speak English, I am in its image. I am in the image of English. It tells me how to think about myself and describe myself. So it didn't make me in its image, meaning in its language and symbols to be sensual. And so how then I, as a poet who writes in English, how do I come back to that? And, and where do I situate these things? And so for me, I wanna hold with you the idea of sensuality and relationality to hold that at the same time that we're holding um, what we'll call here uh, the white alien life form. And the white alien life form, again, uh, the white alien life form for which English is a context. And so beginning to kind of think about that, um, that English is a condition of dislocation. Um, and yet, or and also the white alien life form um, for which English is a context. And so suddenly beginning to shift and kind of parse out and collide what is context and what is condition. Um, and then the, the other thing that I kind of want to, to preface this with is that this is the part of the conversation that I had with, uh, with Hubert this morning is we were talking about, um, we were talking about some words and we ended up arriving at the word white. So our word for white is um, nyamasav, uh, our word for the color white, nyamasav, uh, very close to the word for the color gray, um, nyamasav, and also uh, close to the word for mourning, which is nyamatham. And it makes sense to me that nyamasav, nyamasav, nyamatham um, are all together because for us, um, you know, the world is physical and it's, it's moving. Um, and in the morning when you wake up, there's a, a kind of white gray band across the sky. And we believe that our coyote or hukthar needs to wipe that away before the day can happen. And so those words are all held together. And yet we have an other word for, um, for white person or white man. Um, and so that's gonna be a little, a part of, of some of what I talk with you about as we move forward. So returning to this sentence then to kind of get us on a kind of track or at least a kind of um, pathway. I compelled you to have your hair cut off, not because of any objections to the long hair in itself, but merely because the long hair was a symbol of savagery. So I'm thinking a lot about who becomes the object when we are compelled by the symbols of the English language. And I am compelled by the English language. It's, it's the way that I move, it's the way that I live. Um, it's where I believe or have been taught that my imagination comes from. It's the way I express it. It's where my love exists. Um, and it is the language by which I have to prove my existence, my value, and my worth. And so I'm thinking a lot about that idea of compelled and what that means and the ways that we become compelled in the English language. And that that, that being compelled, that, that state of being compelled also pushes us toward that, that same dislocation of sensuality, dislocation of the body, which puts us in, in the context of symbols. And so I'm thinking a lot about these words in particular because they're very difficult to express uh, indigenous values with words like this, yet here we always are fighting for them and toward them, uh, history, love, kinship, genealogy, inheritance, heir, sovereignty, freedom, origin, and migration. And what, what can those words mean or what does it mean that I fulfill them or become a prophecy of their English iterations? And so moving from there and, and now I'm moving etymologically, I'm thinking a lot about uh, and it, before we move into um, thinking about uh, migration, origin, freedom, and love, uh, we have to make a quick stop, I think, at uh, history and evidence and archive. Uh, so just briefly um, landing here uh, to think about the archive. Um, and again, this is etymological. 
going back to some of its earlier iterations of, of being first, of what was established as being first and how that soon became um, what, what reified or what iterated or manifested the government itself or the, the place of rule. Um, and then, uh, then it became the location for holding those documents that uh, recorded the firsts. And, um, and so to think, about, uh, to think about this in relationship to this letter, um, that this is a kind of history that was told um, that this letter from the superintendent to Homo Se, um, or Pete Lambert, was that this is what was registered or um, given as evidence, that this has become the story, um, that this is in the archive. And so that this young boy, Homo Se, uh, became the chief and led uh, my people, his Mojave people, um, that that is not a part of the story, that what's a part of the story, that's what's recorded as evidence, that what was quote recognized was this moment, uh, feels very essential to me. Um, and that it's, um, it is erasing any kind of quote first, um, and that it's establishing itself as, as being the center of the control and the power. Um, and later in this relationship as well, uh, the superintendent felt that this act was um, a part of uh, Homo Se, who of course was taken to the school, um, part of his quote success um, in relating to uh, the military uh, with our tribe. So, um, and so I'm gonna slip to, um, as we move into this, there's a couple of things that I want to, to hold us down with in terms of thinking about the difference between um, the white alien life form for which English is a context and what I mean by sensuality and relationality in, in language. So this is, um, this is a short video of the border wall uh, down by Ajo um, in Arizona on the US-Mexico border. Uh, it's on Tio or Tejana Atam land. Um, I am Atam, I'm from, I'm Akamel Atam. So uh, Ankh Akamel, I'm, I'm from the river. Uh, whereas this is uh, further down on the border and uh, the wall cuts right across reservation land. And we've probably seen some of the videos online of them blowing up what was called Monument Hill, um, which, you know, had a lot of, um, it, it was just a special place that, you know, it, it was one land in general, but also had had um, relationship to to Tio. Um, but this is right toward Quito by Quito. So right where this ends is, um, if you if you walk maybe uh, I don't know, 200 yards or so, there is a natural spring there that they almost completely drained um, building this wall. But I wanted just to show that and to talk a little bit about what I mean in terms of sensuality and relationality, um, including generosity. There's no word for wall in the Akam language. Uh, this has been something of a rallying cry for, um, for the Atam people who are defending their lands and waters. And in Mojave, if you want to say the word for wall, you uh -huh. must also say the word ava anytime you mention the word wall, which means house. And so just a completely different relationship, relationality, uh, sensuality to existence and to land. So the fact that you have no word for wall, um, and and then in Mojave, if you were to say wall, uh, even if you were trying to find a new way to talk about the border wall, you would still have to say the word house, uh, because that's the only way that we imagine that partition existing is as a way to protect the body or care for the body or a space where one tends uh, to a family. 
so that's something a little bit more on the outside. Um, and then I'm going to take you to a, a smaller word that will um, kind of resound, I think, a little bit more as, as I move on. Um, so my question, again, back to this idea of English and thinking about uh, compelling uh, objection and symbol is if what if we don't ask English to speak for us, but we speak in our own languages into English um, with the tectonics our languages and bodies of water, land, and flesh were built from and let it tremble. And by tremble, I, I don't mean that necessarily. Uh, I mean, I guess I always probably mean it in any language as a kind of hyperbole, a hyperbole of the body, a hyperbole of the imagination. But here I mean it less as, as hyperbole and more as um, just understanding the importance of disruption and understanding even the importance of uh, misunderstanding or inability to understand. I think that's something that the English language tries to, to smooth over is we always need to understand. We always need to arrive at an understanding. We love like words like mutual, you know, because we, we are able to come to some sort of agreement. Um, so I'm thinking of sensualities as being beyond the senses. Um, and a word that I've used really often that this talk has kind of has, has me pressuring right now is the ecstatic. Um, I've thought a lot about the ecstatic one because I, I'm Mojave and I'm also Catholic. So um, I was raised with, with both of these. So every, every young woman, maybe every young queer woman knows um, Saint Therese in ecstasy bent backward with the you know, arrows of love or Jesus in her heart. Um, and so I'm thinking a lot that uh, since the, the danger of sensuality itself um, and, and that the senses are not the same thing as sensuality. Um, even, I mean, snakes even have more than five senses. You know, snakes, snakes don't think of heat as touch. It's an other sense. Um, but I'm thinking that sensuality, um, that, that the ecstatic was possibly born against sensuality as a way to reclaim the danger of sensuality and the body and its relationship to land and to water um, was to create the ecstatic as a kind of um, uh, a, relation, uh, a different relationship with a god or with a power um, as a way to kind of track it. And of course, we know Christianity itself. It exists in Greek and outside of this, but Christianity itself has definitely uh, taken hold of it. So in terms of sensuality, this will be a word that I feel like I use this word when I'm trying to kind of show some of what I mean by, by being by sensuality. And, and I mean, um, I think sensuality is the imagination. I think, I think that's what the imagination is. I don't believe it's intellectual. Um, I believe it, it is uh, your, your, uh, your, the energy in you that is a part of land and, and water and other lives that it's that it's that it's your connection to that. Um, and so uh, this word, so the, the apostrophe is a glottal stop. Um, so if you just say like, uh-uh, uh-uh, the space in between, uh-uh, that could be a way for you to think of the glottal stop. Um, so anya, like we kind of have a pause before it. So anya um, is our word that it means many things. So uh, I'm gonna take you through everything that this word means. Um, and this for me feels like sensuality. It's, it's my language that came, that was built directly from the land. Um, and it's in some ways, uh, I believe um, a manifestation of the land's pleasure and imagination for and of and through my own human body, which is a very small part of that, that energy. So Anya means east, which of course, because that's where the sun rises. So it makes sense that that would be our language for it. Anya also means sun. Anya means day. Anya means time. That is also how we marked what happened. Um, and what, what must be done when there is light out. Anya means hour. Anya means clock. 
Anya means watch, which is a tiny clock that people started wearing on their arms. Anya means light. Anya means bright. Anya eventually meant electricity. Anya eventually meant gold. Anya then meant metal. So then Anya also meant bullet. And this is a story of how the bullet came to us at Fort Mojave. Nyakuro'o. And so you'll hear you'll hear this is Hubert, you'll hear Anya. Um, and what what he's saying is again, because we believe everything is living, uh, is an energy, the Ways the way we first described it was that it had no head and it had no arms and it had no legs, and yet it still moved, which for us was walking. So, um, you so chuksa yumaram isa yumaram no arms um yumaram no legs and then menamentic so it's a way of describing how something uh is is has a shape um so it's almost like saying it's oval except it's not because it's related also to the fact that uh we said it has no head or arms or legs so that that also affects the shape so we're imagining now how it could possibly move. So if this shape was moving, so it's almost a kind of uh, wobbling. And so it came across the shore and it landed in our bodies. And that's what they told us. And so again, thinking about that kind of sensuality that also includes includes violence. I think that's a really important thing to, or it's become important for me to consider when I'm thinking about what is violence. And especially in this small kind of context or condition that I'm trying to establish between sensuality and relationality and the white alien light form for which English is a context. So how does violence differ um, in relationship to either of those? And that a word for sun or light could also be a bullet. Um, and so I think a lot about the demand of sensuality and again, uh, the danger of that, why English needs to dislocate from it um, and why it needs to dislocate us from our own sensualities, because I do think it, it is demanding a kind of relationality. Uh, it teaches us how sensuality teaches us how to relate better. Um, and so I'm gonna stop right here. Um, and then, okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing real quick and then um, I'm gonna pull us back. So as we're thinking about that, something that I wanna like pull into our conversation is, um, and I really am, I, I know that uh, Omar had said, this is a space where you can come to think. And I, as you can see, I'm thinking right alongside you. There's, I'm just kind of uh, suturing or possibly um, fraying some notes, but something I think I wanna bring in before we start thinking together is uh, that there, there are certain structures. Um, well, so thinking about history, evidence in the archive, um, and the idea of the first and what they're trying to establish of the first. One of the larger uh, structures that's problematic or that I believe is anti-life is the structure of time. Um, and thinking of time and duration. And this is something that um, an indigenous scholar, Megan Bang and I have been talking a lot about time and duration. Um, 
and that duration, which is necess again necessary to the organization of the white alien life form. Um, and so thinking of time as anti-life and as this white alien life form is also anti-life, um, an anti-life life form. And so, you know, and not to belabor that, that white alien life form, but in terms of thinking about the English language, I'm constantly trying to return to words like natural. Well, the natural condition. Well, what does that mean? Well, the first condition. So how do you escape that? And one of the ways that that it that strikes me is that we are all we, meaning the non-white alien life form, are constantly trying to uh, explain or prove that idea of evidence, that terrible, that terrible structure of evidence where we are trying to prove when when just mathematically. If there's one, one group that is predominantly asking everyone else to prove that they're not wrong or to prove that they can exist, you know, what does that mean of what the alien is? And so some of this is also problematic in my mind as I'm thinking it out because I think alien comes with a very particular context. So I'm trying to pull that back into a Mojave kind of condition of language versus the English context. Because um, I think context is extremely dangerous. Uh, I think I'm most interested in the conditions that that exist or that subvert or that can't be pinned down, whereas the context is trying to make us all um, agree or meet somewhere in a kind of agreement. And so I'm thinking a lot that that and and I'm going to say our and I'm going to think in particular right in this moment about Mojave, but I, I this can mean any any hours or we's that you might feel you are a part of, but our pleasures, our origins. Um, our reorganizings, our rearrangements, our migrations, our violences, our deaths um, have always been of life. You know, even our deaths have always been of life. Even our violences have been of life because they have been relational to land, to water, and to the non human. And that to me feels like one of the greatest differences in, for me to think about what I mean by the white alien life form. Um, and what, what it disallows of me and what I have been trying to fight for from it that may never come um, because I am not the alien. And so I wanna think a little bit about that because this to me is something that is very important to a much larger definition of indigeneity. Um, and I'll, I'll again, harken back to Megan Bang and to uh, Brian Brayboy who I've been thinking alongside in this and, and my partner Soretta Morgan as well. But the, the need to, uh, to broaden and extend and make more generous um, the idea of indigeneity or the concept or even the language itself of indigeneity, um, it's very easy in the United States for it to be Native American, whoever the Native American is. Um, and so I'm thinking that alien in the ways that I need it to mean or to, to, to be generous enough to, to move into is that alien is not, um, Alien is not who is not, quote, from here. Like that, to me, that's not what alien is. It does not mean who is not from here, but it, it is who is not connected to. And, and by that, who is not in relationship with. And to be in relationship with is something that everybody can do in terms of the practice of how they arrive or how they receive one another. Um, and so indigeneity then becomes much larger and, and who is indigenous and who is then alien becomes a, a very different dynamic or a very different power structure. Um, and so thinking about to be in relationship with land, with water, um, with, with one another, with persons, with language, uh, and to understand that those are all connected. Um, and so again, the white alien life form lacks that sensuality. And I don't know that it's actually capable, if English is capable of that sensuality. Um, and so again, sensuality not being a list of senses. And, and one of the reasons why this idea of the white alien life form came to me, and I was talking with, with Omar and Nada and, and Ricky was on as well a little bit earlier, is that when I was talking with my elder today, we were talking again about that, that white, the white man had nothing to do with our color for white. Our color for white is connected to morning. It's connected to what we see in the morning and, and the way the sky and the atmosphere works. Um, but we have a word, tinyam uh, kohiyar, uh, and tinyam for us is night. So tinyam kohiyar is that 
the white man, that's our, one of our words for white man, uh, the white man came at us flying from the night. And so the first thing I said to, to Hubert, I was like, oh, so he was like an alien, right? And then, you know, which makes kind of sense, like, you know, for me, you know, and I'm thinking now of the alien from outer space, but I'm also thinking about, you know, what that means to shift that lens in that I don't need to explain, but, but that, that they have arrived here to me um, and that my condition is the condition. My condition is uh, that generous, that relational, that sensual condition. And it's simply illegible to them. And I think a lot about how young, and not to make excuses for them, because in some ways they're extremely old and, and knowledgeable, but how young, um, and, and right now I'm thinking in particular of, of America, United States, how young this language is and these people are, and, and yet the ways they've managed to speed up or catch up in, with certain, in regard to certain violences um, is, is astounding in some ways. And so thinking about this idea of the white alien life form then, um, and I'll, I'll, before I finish, I'll track back to uh, origin, migration, love and freedom, is that in some ways, history, because we're also talking about time being problematic, so time is history, is that history in some ways is simply the tales of their discovery. History then is a kind of travelogue. Um, and so I'm thinking a little bit about that, that it's not, it's not a story, it's a, a power structure. Um, and then thinking that it's not even evidence. It, it's simply what they have, have um, marked or made evident. So it's not even evidence, um, but a kind of accumulation or, or a narrative of, um, of the evidence that they have decided to weigh. And then, and then also just kind of pressing on the idea of evidence itself, because again, I, I think that I have found myself many times trying to prove myself in this language in many situations, um, you know, proving this is my land, proving this is my water, proving its import, proving my own, um, uh, my own, you know, life itself, but that, that evidence is not designed toward life that evidence is designed toward law um, and that it's an alien law because it's a law that has no relationship with the land except for to make it object, which is property. So the objection, of course, that the superintendent made earlier, um, you know, I have no objection except that it is a symbol of savagery. And so when, when the object then becomes important and land can become property, then you become a symbol, you're no longer yourself once that relationship to land and property is established. And of course, we've seen this with, um, you know, with the transatlantic uh, slave trade, with, with chattel slavery, with enslavement. We've seen this multiple times over. We, you know, Sarita is talking about this, you know, with the, um, the, the indigenous tribes from what we call Patagonia, you know, all of this, all the way through, it's the same exact structure. And it's been uh, performed by the same um, alien white life form, which I find, you know, at once striking and also not surprising. And so the, the necessary then distinction, because I think often I find myself in, I look around and I see my peers or I see the conversations I'm in, we're trying to rewrite history. I mean, that's literally a phrase that we, I'm going to rewrite history, like I re, whereas I don't believe that history has the capacity for origin. And origin is what is essential to being. Um, I don't know the origin of the human white life form. Uh, I do know my origin because I can look out my front door. Um, and, and by origin, I don't necessarily, I, you know, that example, I don't mean to tie it and tether it to land because I, I believe that origin can happen in many ways. Um, but history, I think history and origin are two very different things, but sometimes we are forced to go through history. We're compelled, again, we're compelled by the English language to go back through the English language structures to try to prove ourselves. Um, and so history in some ways is one of those things that we're compelled toward. You know, I've spent probably most of my artistic life fighting against history, uh, trying to prove myself against history. And what does that mean? And so I'm thinking in terms of history, that it's a kind of like retro surveillance that allows the current surveillance to happen, right? It pins us down so that it can, can continue to prophesy how we move forward. And so I think 
of history a little bit like, you know, an autopsy. And, you know, it, these, is, this, these are the entrance and the exit wounds. Like this is what has happened to you and this is what you deserved for it to have happened to you. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking about that in a way that I don't necessarily know how to reckon with yet. And, and just history even, you know, as this, history is like a slogan of sorts, right? You know, it's like what doesn't kill you or what didn't kill you is what makes you American in some respects. And so, you know, what does it mean for me to try to grapple with that in the English language, um, in its structures of the English language? Um, and I mean, this, I, I could, I feel like I could very easily drop this down to the Spanish language and think about colonization and language, you know, in Central and South America. Um, but again, history as, as being another type of property, right? It maps, it maps us the way that it has mapped the land and it has created a, a kind of currency. Um, and so against history is, is where I think I would argue for the idea of origin and why that's so essential and so important. Um, and that, that origin and migration are naturally linked, that, that one allows the other to happen, that one infuses the other. Um, and, and again, back to time, that, that origin is definitely not singular. I think that's, that's definitely a narrative that has been told. And I think this is also something that dislocates um, a lot of migrants or a lot of, um, you know, my partner and I, my partner's black, we talk about this a lot, about what it means to be dislocated, what it means to dislocate those who have been dislocated. Uh, where do our ideas of land and our relationships of language with land, how do those um, mitigate or um, disrupt our relationality to one another and to where we are? And so we think of indigeneity as being a practice a practice of your of where you are and your relationship there, um, and and origin being again like really important to me because, again etymologically, uh, it's it's gesture toward rising, you know that it's a rising. So there's an implied descent. So knowing that there's then momentum that you can have many origins, multiple origins as many times as you might need them. Um, there's a group called the uh, Halchidom, uh, or who are known as Pipash, who lived here near, um, near us. And we say Hal anytime there's something to do with water, because um, Aha is our word for water. Well, so they grew up or lived on our river, so north and south and east and west. So our river runs north and south, and that's how they, they told um, directions based on the river. And so they moved further down. Um, we got in a fight with them and we, we moved them further down. So now they live uh, down next to my other reservation, which is uh, Akama Atham land or uh, Gila River in Sakatone. So we have um, the Pipash Maricopa um, tribe there, Pipash. And when they moved, they had a new origin. So their direction shifted because their river now runs east to west. And so what was once south, Kavek, is now west. So just, you know, this idea that, that we're not written down or pinned down by history, but that's what the English language does. It refuses to make corrections. I mean, we, we're seeing that played out in real time. Um, whereas the conditions of our languages based on the land are built to migrate, to shift, to move, to seed, to be reseeded, to carry, to receive. Um, and, and something that feels essential um, is the ability, and this is, I think, something that is denied um, to origins that, that to me is essential, is that we do not allow for return um, in origins and migrations. And that feels essential. And, and that feels a part of the English language, which I think the English language is, operates in a state of emergency. And it puts us in a, a state of precarity. And I'm thinking about this idea of, of emergency. The emergency always is land. It will forever be land for the English language. And, you know, again, takes us back to property. Um, but what does that mean to be in a state of, what does that emergency mean um, for us? And, and what does that mean then of, of our ability to deny migrants or to create immigrants out of what would normally be a migration? 
um, you know, and the, the conditions for migration have always been what they are now, sometimes violence, sometimes the natural world, sometimes curiosity, sometimes pop population, sometimes food, um, sometimes relationship. And so thinking about that in, re in relationship to, to origin and migration, um, and then especially diaspora, which I feel like diasporic studies and conversations right now, to me, feel the most generous for in conversations about indigeneity. Um, and, and what that means of, of the ability to return. Um, yeah, and so I'll, I'll finish, I'm gonna pop this back up because I want to, um, yeah, and this has been a little, I know this has been a little bit um, of a messy thought process, but I want to end with this quote as I think about love and freedom, because this to me is, has been um, an important part of the conversations that I have been having. So this is a poem from my, part, my partner, uh, who is a poet, Soretta Morgan. Um, and this is a piece of one of her poems. And I've been extremely interested in freedom because it's, it's not a word we often use in our house. Um, and I was talking with my friend Megan Bang recently about this. And one of the questions she asked is like, do I actually want freedom? Maybe it's something else that I want. And so I think that it feels important to me, origin and migration and love feel essential to me thinking about what we all mean by freedom, because I think it has become a symbol. We're compelled toward, toward it, of course, because of the English language structures and because of our relationships with English. And as we try to connect to one another, strange structures like empathy, you know. Um, and, and so thinking about what it is we, we each might mean by freedom, I think we mostly don't know. Um, and this question to me feels important to the way I might live in a single day. Um, I want to wake every morning into love, where love is the question of how I'm going to help you get free, where that means whatever it needs to mean. And so for me, there's nothing else I might say about love outside of this quote in many ways in that what does it mean to care and to tend, um, to wake into every morning beyond the scope of time. So this isn't about duration. This isn't about who can last. This isn't about who can absorb um, and endure. This is about every single morning, not, not the emergency, um, because I think, again, the emergency is, is something uh, event-based, but something that is a little bit more episodic or a little bit more prone to origin and migration, that it can shift each day what I might need, what she might need, what you might need. Where love is the question of how I'm going to help you get free, where that means whatever it needs to mean. And so... I will stop sharing right there and